So Dr. Justin Ballinger can introduce our amazing speaker. Dr. Justin Ballinger is the deputy director here at the AUC Data Science Initiative and also assistant professor of STEM education at Morehouse College. Dr. Ballinger. Thank you, Dr. Washington. Uh, hello, and thanks again for joining us for the seminar. This promises to be an engaging and amazing talk. Uh, this is a phenomenal individual that we have joining us today, uh, Ms. Lakeisha French. Uh, she's a visionary, an entrepreneur, thought leader. Um, she is the founder and CEO of the Future in Color Institute, which is focused on uh, analyzing, monitoring, and growing Black wealth and Black GDP globally. Um, she also serves as the CEO and president of Preneurology, <clears throat> excuse me, which is an organization that uh, supports the growth of Black entrepreneurs. Um, she is a international consultant for the growth of businesses and <clears throat> a serial entrepreneur who has 10 x multiple companies. Um, so uh, this is an amazing talk, amazing work that they're doing around uh, the growth of Black GDP and actually analyzing the data around how we can more effectively support that through multiple institutions and partnerships. Um, so we're thankful for uh, Ms. French joining us today. And without any further ado, uh, Ms. Lakeisha French. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, um, Dr. Ballinger, Dr. Washington. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to uh, get into a conversation with you all about the future in color and um, what exactly the Black GDP is. Uh, the work for uh, the future in color began back in 2018. We were looking at the data around uh, 2045 and we looked at the census and saw that you know there would be a new majority as of 2045. And then we looked at 2050, looking at the largest concentration of young people uh, being on the continent of Africa by 2050. And when you look at 2053, uh, the data came out looking at the average um, household wealth for the black community uh, estimated to be zero negative. And so when you um, look at all of those data points, uh, we also started looking at what was happening in the economy uh, around AI, emerging technology, and we saw a window of opportunity and asked ourselves a question. The future obviously is color. It is an inclusive future. Uh, and if there's to be a new majority and these sort of demographic uh, shifts happening, how could we leverage that and take advantage of what's happening with emerging technology and ensure that the global black community has a hand in shaping the future of the economy, has a pathway to parity, both social and economic. And so that's where the Future in Color Institute was birthed. Uh, we quickly realized that this needed to be uh, work that was institutionalized. And so, the next piece I'll move into is uh, thinking about the Black GDP. And this work began when we were seed funded for a grant from the Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative, as well as the Annie Casey Foundation. And we wanted to look at if we are to expand the G expand GDP through the global Black community, which we uh, nicknamed at the time the Black GDP, if we were to expand it, what, what would that look like, right? How, by how much do we need to expand it? And so uh, we realized really quickly that we didn't have enough data to be able to level set against, to be able to make projections into 2053 and to 2045. So we decided that we wanted to quantify the economic contributions of the black community. And that was a huge undertaking. Uh, it's still underway, but it was really important for us to have black researchers and black data scientists that were part of this work. And so we wanted to look at sectors and industries and regions where there was one uh, high growth in terms of the industries and sectors that will create, transfer, um, and accumulate the most wealth by 2045 and 2053, as well as communities and emerging economies that had a large population of the Black community that could very well be the infrastructure of that future economy. So we began Again, there, and we went back about 100 years um, to begin to look at what the trajectory of Black innovation and entrepreneurship was. Uh, there are plenty of successful Black businesses and entrepreneurs and innovators that have existed. And so we wanted to quantify that data so that we could do 
look at that data and then level set where we are, begin to calculate how many black attorneys do we have in the uh, energy sector, in the music industry, you know, where are we? And then we could make projections into the future and come up with a number to look at how many um, people in this particular sector and industry, how many businesses do we need in order to, for instance, expand the Black GDP by 50% by 2053. And so for us, this was really exciting because we were seeing tons of reports that were coming out from uh, really credible sources, of course, but it was all about a deficit mindset. It was all about the disparities and what we don't have as a community. And so we thought, you know, quantifying these economic contributions, looking at the projections, getting to an almost prescriptive economic strategy, applied economic strategy. Uh, we wanted to tell this story from an asset-based mindset and allow the data to allow us to tell that story. Um, abundance, you know, and we do believe that we have enough, but if we don't have the data and the numbers, we can't begin to backwards design what 2053 looks like. And so uh, the future is color, but we clearly have to realize that. We have to shape it and create it. Otherwise, we'll continue on this path of reskilling, right, folks for job, the jobs of the future, but we won't have any ownership. We won't be able to shape and influence global markets. And so we, we, you know, we want to think about 2053 um, as a roadmap. Right. And so we started with this campaign of, you know, the road to 2053. And we want to invite others to join us to say we want a new projection. Right. We do not believe in zero negative wealth um, as our average household income. But how do we take that data and take this a uh, new narrative that we're building and execute it and put it into action. So the Future and in Color Institute quickly developed into a global think to action tank, you know, focused on just that. And so the action piece of it is that we're going to be working with uh, different cohorts of Black innovators, entrepreneurs, and creatives that are building and developing um, in those sectors and industries that we're looking at looking at 2053. And so what do we need to do to help them to get over the finish line? So initially, we're going to start by working with high growth, potential high growth um, in mature stage companies and um, entrepreneurs because they're already supported by really, I mean, amazing incubators, accelerators, private equity firms that are supporting these businesses in the climate sector, clean energy, across aerospace, right, uh, across the board. However, uh, we don't have a plan. We don't have a strategy. So, you know, when we think about, for instance, gentrification and, you know, we look at there was a 20 plus year strategy right before this happened. And so when we think about 2053, we want the data to be able to say, you know, we're tracking and measuring how we're moving, you know, um, is, you know, home ownership, entrepreneurship, what are the things that are going to help us to accelerate and to ensure that we can catapult our community um, and into the future economies. And so that's, that's been our, you know, our, our life's work um, since 2018. It um, was certainly a conviction for me coming from a background of building uh, tech innovation ecosystems, uh, working with entrepreneurs on the ground. And I just quickly realized that there was large systems change that needed to happen. Uh, when we look at what the vision is, is, is for us to be able to use this data, use this, 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 G, this GDP, uh, the reports that we'll have to be able to track and measure and build this roadmap and to be able to have policy recommendations that are shaped around our community and what this path looks like, this data-driven, strategic, um, pr precise, um, you know, quantified path looks like for us. Uh, and then to be able to increase investment, right? Because we know that we need capital to be able to start businesses. Um, and so we focus on four pillars, innovation, ownership, advocacy and investments. And so we want to get our community more active in the black GDP. And I'll, you know, quote one of our advisors who always says, um, there is no GDP without the black GDP. Uh, but, but we want to be clear that we don't want to focus on spending power. We want to focus on production, right? So um, producing uh, and, and being able to get a return on investment. We have 
uh, been the asset class and the commodity, um, not just for the U.S. economy, but for the global economy. And so we really want to, you know, uh, change that and we want to use data to drive it. So uh, pleasure to, to be here and to be in community. And, and we're looking, you know, for partnerships, um, data scientists and um, anybody really who wants to come on board to help us to build this roadmap and as we say, a new projection um, because we cannot accept zero negative wealth. Oh, thank you so much uh, for joining us, Lakeisha. And uh, we can move to the uh, portion where we uh, start asking, uh, we'll, we'll go through our poll first um, to see who's in the room. And, and then we can move into asking some uh, questions from the audience. All right, so for today's uh, meeting, uh, we asked, what is your status? About 23% of our participants are students. Uh, about 77% are either graduated or working professionals. Of our students, 5% are freshmen, 5% sophomores, 5% juniors, 5% seniors, 9% master's students, and 9% PhD students. And then 64% are working professionals. Uh, we're 45% female, 50% male, 5% non-binary. And uh, where are we coming from? 50% of us are in Georgia, 45% uh, not in Georgia, but in the U.S., and 5% international. So we're reaching worldwide. And our last question was open-ended. Um, uh, and this is the first open-ended question that we've had. So thank you for this, uh, <laughs> Lakeisha. What is your vision for Black America by 2053. So that might be a good way to uh, continue framing our conversation. If anybody would uh, be willing to maybe uh, place a few points in the chat about your vision for Black America, or again, any questions that you might have for uh, Lakeisha um, today. And Dr. Ballinger, if you uh, click the view details, I think there are some responses in there as well. Thank you. And uh, while I'm pulling this up, uh, you spoke about the four pillars of the work that you all are doing uh, with the Future of Color Institute. Uh, could you uh, dive a little bit deeper into those four pillars of the Future in Color Institute? Sure, sure. So um, I'll start. So our four pillars are um, really how, one, how we'll be uh, uh, presenting the data uh, within the Black GDP report that will come out um, in September of this year. Uh, and so when, I, when we talk about um, both historical contributions and quantifying those um, in the Black community, um, but also level setting where we are today, uh, and then the projections um, in 2053, uh, we look at uh, innovation, right? So thinking about um, Patent trademarks, um, things that you can you know measure in terms of tracking you know our innovation that's been produced and created over time and current day. Um, we think about uh, the creator economy, right? When we think about um, innovation, uh, ownership, of course, uh, and we said ownership because it's more than entrepreneurship. We have you know um, startups, businesses, you know. Uh, solo entrepreneurs, right? And so having ownership of land, right? Um, so again, things that we can track and measure in terms of ownership, um, even across those sectors and industries. Uh, advocacy, right? And so, you know, how are, you know, the, the where are we, you know, now currently um, from an advocacy perspective and then uh, investments, right? Where the investments, so we think about the stock market, you know, how many black businesses, are in the stock market, where are our investments, um, again, looking across sectors, industries, and regions. And so, um, but those are also the pillars that we look at when we think about how do we get uh, our community more active in, in the Black GDP and um, with the goal of expanding it, right, and, and being able to shape the future of economies and uh, industries and sectors. So uh, that's why we focused on those four pillars. Uh, we were, you know, certainly thinking about the being able to track and measure um, and also quantify and you know we'll expand out of course but we wanted to have something that was um, 
um, tangible, uh, where we could have both a, you know, sort of um, high level uh, approach and a, you know, community, you know, grassroots approach to really get, you know, people involved in this, um, as opposed to keeping this movement and work and conversation in boardrooms and, you know, corporations, we wanted to get our entrepreneurs and innovators, um, the folks that will actually be driving the GDP and expanding it to get them um, involved. Wonderful. And we have a, a few questions that have entered into the chat now. Um, so uh, first question uh, from Ursula Leverett, um, considering historically documented successes and prescriptive analytics, what if any long-term sustainable strategies will move the needle towards cultural ways of knowing? Sure, sure. I'd love to dive into that. Um, I, I thought this question was really interesting, and I'm, I'm, I appreciate it. Uh, so one of one of the reasons that we, you know, we did have to go back, right, and we realized there was a huge historical component of quantifying this um, and level setting against it is because, to uh, your point, um, Ursula, there has been success, right, and, but we we don't fully understand all of the nuances. There's a trust issue that's there, right, in a lot of our economic activity within our community. Um, is not documented. And so there's a lot of primary data and, 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 you know, qualitative data that we are collecting on that side to begin to understand what those are. Um, we didn't want to just assume off of, you know, existing public facing aggregated data, right? We want to sort of disaggregate it. And uh, so those, those strategies are things that will be, um, you know, in the report, but I can tell you one of the uh, opportunities and challenges that we ran into when doing this work is culture, right? So it's interesting that you said cultural ways. Um, as we looked at the indicators, we realized we potentially had to pull out culture, right? And really like the whole challenge of quantifying culture, right, um, is, is, is what came up for us. Um, when you think about um, what drives the economy right now. And when everybody says, well, culture drives the economy, black culture drives the economy. And so how do you begin to quantify that? So uh, to be honest, a huge piece of our work right now is quantifying the culture. And so um, that, that particular uh, indicator is something that we want to see in the economic measurement of health of the future. Uh, and it's something that we're going to really hone in on with this work. Uh, so, you know, there'll be the Black GDP report, but we do want to start um, having conversations around culture because so much of activity within the global Black diaspora and community is shaped around that. And to be honest, in terms of our return on investment, if you think about us not repeating the same cycles um, and now going forward, you know, you can look at celebrities and and influential folks who, you know, we clearly see that they contribute to certain industries and sectors. You can look at the music industry, sports, fashion, right? Um, we don't know the numbers. And, and we've done, uh, we've, we've talked with the Recording Academy. Uh, we've had conversations with NASA and others around, you know, searching for this data. Um, do you have data on the economic contributions, right, of the Black community? The answer was no. Uh, even from the recording recording academy, they have a four percent participation from Black um, people on the recording academy, given our contribution to music. So that's just one example um, of why quantifying culture is a huge piece, and then the point of doing that historical quantification so that we can um, begin to uncover the, those sustainable strategies. Wow. Um, next question I see is from Zena Johnson. It says. If I am not a data sci scientist, how can I be of assistance or contribute to this work? Oh, you are the work. You are the work. Uh, no, I, I think, listen, you know, um, at the heart of this, right, um, are, are data scientists, Black data scientists, which is why um, organizations like the AUC Data Science Center are important. And we're so happy you guys exist um, because our work would be so much harder. But in terms of overall, um, not just the Black community, but everyone, you know, how do you get involved? Um, we need as many data sources as we could find. Um, we, we need, you know, companies, corporations to give access to data. Um, and it's not that some of this data doesn't exist. It's just that it's not, you know, available, right, and visible. Um, I think uh, helping to expand the, the Black GDP, you know, figuring, you know, um, tapping in with us, uh, joining the Future in Color 
um, alliance, um, starting a business, you know, getting on one of those pillars, you know, innovation, advocacy, ownership, investments, right? Um, sharing with us your journey. Uh, we're going to be, you know, offering for folks to to have a pledge. And so GoFundMe is going to partner with us on that. So uh, in a few months, we will have a pledge coming out where you can, you know, sign our manifesto and and um, become a part of, of, of what we're doing. Um, so that that's my question. Like, we, we need everybody. We need um, majors across the board, students, even if you major in uh, aerospace, right? We need you involved in this initiative. Um, we do not know our numbers. And that is a challenge, but a huge opportunity as well. So again, while we appreciate the reports that, you know, McKinsey and Brookings and others put out, um, we want this report to be one of abundance and assets and about what we do have and how we can build strategies going forward. So we need everybody's input. Yeah. The importance of asset-based asset models. Um, next, we have Waitez Phelps who asks, what are the responsibilities of municipal governments to increase Black entrepreneurship? Yes. So one of the partnerships that we have is with the African American Mayors Association. And the reason we partnered with them very early on is because when we think about shaping the future of economies, um, making sure that the global Black community, uh, even just here in the U.S., right, um, it's not just participating as the future workforce, but that we are um, in the game, right? We're in the number. And so uh, where there are a lot of uh, emerging economies across the U.S., you know, like Birmingham, St. Louis, you know, um, New Orleans, where you have Black leadership and you have a huge Black population. And so we have a lot of development projects that are coming down, infrastructure and otherwise, right? Those projects need workforce, they need businesses, you know, contracts. And so we want the people in the community, the Black community, to be the infrastructure of that future economy. And so we have to start getting very intentional about this. And so we talk with a lot of the Black mayors across the country. And one of the challenges that they're having is that they have these development projects. However, you have people who literally come into the city or the town and they bring they they won't even purchase lunch in the community. They bring their lunch. They come in and make money off of the project, and then they leave and go back to their community, right? Uh, or they come and stay for the period. And so it's not the people who are living there who are potentially you know poised to be the infrastructure, whether through ownership, advocacy, ownership or investment, right? Um, participating in that. So one of the things we're doing is. Um, getting uh, the black mayors involved and um, focusing on a number of key cities, emerging markets across the country. And so April 26th, we'll be um, uh, partnering with other organizations to host the official reception for the African American Mayors Conference that will be in Atlanta. And um, we'll be talking about some of what, what some of that partnership looks like, but this is why we have a regional approach to the work. Wow, powerful. Um... Next, uh, Desha Elliott asks, when is the expected timeline to disseminate the research from this data? What stakeholders are currently on the waiting list for this data? Sure, sure. Uh, so right now, the report um, is expected to release the end of September during Global Week, uh, during the UN General Assembly. Uh, there's a few things happening um, in New York that week, uh, the Clinton Global Initiative. We'll be doing an activation on the floor there. Um, we'll be working with NASDAQ and uh, New York Stock Exchange and others to, you know, you do your aesthetic of ringing a bell. Of course, for us, what's more important is that we're elevating and involving the way in which we talk about Black economic futures um, from a data perspective. So we're looking forward to launching the report on Wall Street. Street um, uh, at the end of September. And um, I just, you know, mentioned some of the organizations that are already on board uh, that we are, you know, partnering with, um, like your NASDAQ and uh, New York Stock Exchange. Uh, we're um, in talks with other financial institutions that I'm not at liberty to say yet. Um, Clinton Global Initiative, Milken Institute. So there's, you know, we're deep in the financial sector. And that is because we, it was important for us that this was not just another report or set of data that was about nostalgia, right? Although there'll be some great stories that will come out of it. And it sounds really, you know, um, exciting to say the future is color, right? And you feel that we wanted it to be grounded in data and to really sh build a new narrative. So um, we're going to spend a lot of time on the ground with CDFIs and banks. Um, we're partnering with the National Association of Black Banks and others. Um, so those are just some of the, the partners that are on board. 
Amazing. Um, next question is from Philip Neely. And uh, this, this one is a little long, so we'll you know, <laughs> try Let's to walk it. through the points on it. So detailed question. When the pand pandemic hit, one of the first factors that had obvious implications was in the death rates among African-Americans. One reason was the high representation we had in labor that was manual, could not be done remote, exposing us to the virus. Where does occupational opportunities fit in your projections? Yes, so um, thank you for that question. Uh, and I'll get just a little granular for a second um, to be able to, 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 to touch on your question. Uh, one of the um, areas that we focused on really early was talking with labor unions. Um, a huge part of this is that when we think about industry 4.0, when we think about emerging technology, how every facet of life is being changed by AI and, and other emerging technologies, we're on our way to quantum, right? Um, again, we saw opportunity, but we're also, we're, we're still, we're already behind, right? And so um, for us, it was important to, to look at what the current solutions uh, were, were that were in place. And um, so there was a lot of talk about reskilling. And then when you think about the pandemic, right, and the fact that we were out there on the front lines, it makes us think about the future and how, again, we can leverage this. So I always tell people, you know, it's not AI, um, a technology that's AI that's going to take, you know, the, replace jobs or take your job. It's the people that learn to use it, to use AI, right, <laughs> that will take your job. So I think we we have to think about not just reskilling, but having ownership in AI and emerging technologies when we start our businesses. And this is something that we're going to focus on, you know, with our cohorts, um, making sure that um, this is not an option anymore, right? And so uh, making sure that we are making that shift. And But again, here's where the data comes in, right? Um, for instance, I went to the Illuminarium in Atlanta a few months ago, and um, they were showing like um, some pictures of Neil Armstrong and they were showing space. And my son was like, mom, what's that? So we couldn't tell what it was. It looked like a little house that was um, on the wall. And so the woman who worked there, she said, oh, that's a um, that's one of the houses that will be on the lunar colonies. So we we're like, what? I was like, oh, OK, is this just like a, you know, fictitious thing? She said, oh, no, 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 ma'am. She said they're already actually like they're modeled out. And actually, there's like two companies, right, that are, you know, that that have the patent to sort of like build them and the materials. And I said, oh, really? And I said, well, we're, you know, you know where they're located? And she's like, I'm not sure. But she gave me the name of one of them. And of course, I went home and researched it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's one of the companies is in Wisconsin. But, but my point is, is, and so this company, that's like discovering lumber before you knew that you could use it to build houses, right? So so they have the patent on it. By the time we get to the party, all the wealth is is gone. You know, it's it, it, the, the trickle down is low, and we end up again being in the position like you just mentioned. We were during the pandemic, we're doing the all the all the jobs that put us at most risk and exposure and the lowest rate of return, right? And so this is part of the reason. You know, we didn't name the institute the Black GDP or GDP Institute. Um, it's the future in color, and it's you know we're very much looking at how do we leverage these shifts uh, to position us better. So the data, again, getting to the point where we know how many, you know, business owners and 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 uh, patents and trademarks, you know, do we need to start to build in these spaces so that when we get to 2053, when we get to 2045, we are not that same community that's at risk and exposed and dying at a higher rate. There are other reasons we were dying at higher rates as well, but because uh, that, that's a whole nother conversation getting into the correlation between health and, and, and wealth. Um, but we know that without wealth um, and, and taking care of this, and, and this is why we're focused, focused on the economic lens, um, it's, you know, health, you can acquire, you know, the health that we need to in the healthcare without wealth, like everything is attached to it. And while we know we want to dismantle capitalism as it stands, that doesn't happen overnight, right? And so again, this is why we're focused on like a very precision, you know, based applied economic approach that we're hoping has those social um, impacts uh, that, that you know, that you're alluding to um, in terms of like, you know, almost something like a pandemic happens, right? How do we make sure we're positioned so that we are not dying at the highest rates out of any population? Yeah. All right, our next question um, comes from uh, Dr. Edwin Knox. Does the data 
look at the difference in various Black American populations. Yes, that's one of the most exciting parts about um, about this work, and that's why we institutionalized it. Uh, we at first thought that this was going to be a initiative. Um, so if you look at some places, you'll see like Future and in Color Initiative or um, the Black GDP Project. We, we saw that when you think about this new majority that will exist, right, by 2045 in the U.S., 2050 globally, one of the reasons we're not able to properly track um, Black economic activity, trust is a piece, but because of that also, we don't really understand, we're not a monolith community, right? And so there's so many different cultures and, and, and groups within our um, within our community. And so um, we have to track economic data in that way as well. And so this is why the qualitative piece is so important. We're going to have to do a lot of groundwork, and we already are, um, to begin to, to get to that place where we can start to um, tell those stories, right, and, and, and pull that qualitative data from that. And that's something that you'll see in the Black GDP report, right? Um, so this, for us, also was an opportunity to begin to um, have dialogue um, and to sort of uh, lift the veil uh, with, within our community to expose. So, because, listen, um, we talk about cultural economics a lot, right? And so how people spend money, how you move, how you acquire wealth, how you build businesses, your your um, your morals and values around work, all of that is influenced by culture, right? And so culture could be, you know, established in a household, it's in a particular community. I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey, Newark, you know, uh, tri-state area, you know, how somebody in New Orleans, right, um, you know, uh, the African-American community or Haitian-American, there's so many different uh, cultures. And so we just have never taken a time to pause to focus solely on that. So that's why we're excited about the fact that the Future in Color is an institute, because we do want to host convenings and have that dialogue. But make no mistake about it, we'll constantly be tracking that data and pulling that qualitative data, primary data um, that, you know, may not be a, um, a, a, a Brookings report, right? And we are, you know, talking with Brookings and others, but for us, it was important that this was a truth source and that this data was protected as well. So we won't be sharing every piece of this data forward facing, um, and some of it will be utilized simply for business intelligence. Uh, entrepreneurial intelligence for the community and those who serve um, the the community. Wow. And that speaks uh, to the importance of data sovereignty for our community. So um, Absolutely. amazing. And, and it segues, segues nicely into our next question from Douglas Austin, which asked um, about the Black GDP versus American uh, US GDP average. Um, what is the metric on a per capita basis uh, if we compare the average U.S. GDP uh, to the average Black uh, GDP? Yes, yes. Um, Douglas, great question. And um, would, would love to get like super, super in the weeds with you um, about that after this. Um, what I will say is that what we're, one of the things that we've talked about early on as well is that this is about global competitiveness as well. That's just not what the Future and Color Institute wants to focus on. You know, for us, we're we're happy that, you know, this, you know, the, the black GDP will drive overall GDP, right? But but one of the things is that it always has, right? We've been the invisible engine of the economy, right? US and global. And so what this really is is just uncovering it. Um, but what we want to look at from a data perspective, um, um, and I want to say, you know, when you ask about, you know, per capita basis, we're almost like not throwing all that out the window, but we're questioning everything. Right. And that's the, the beautiful part about um, uh, data sovereignty. Right. And so we're saying that we want to look at, you know, the even with the census. Right. I mean, you say like right now we're 13 percent of the population. Well, what we could start is that we want our economic activity, our production rate to be uh, equitable to our uh, our, our demographic um, percentage. And we want to start there. We do have assumptions that we're not all counted in <laughs> or counted for, um, for, sometimes overlooked and other times intentionally excluded. So uh, those are some of the questions we're asking ourselves. We don't have all the answers, but what we could say is that we're, we're trying to start from the most 
truth source um, that we can and uh, we're questioning everything. So we're, we're, we're not using all traditional, you know, methods um, to do this, which is why some of the data will not be forward facing, you know, other parts of the data. And this is why we also have a alliance, right? Um, a collaborative of folks. Um, and, and, and over time, right, it'll, we hope that the data will be adopted and, and given, you know, uh, tons of utility, but uh, we, we also just need to tell the right story, tell the truth, right? And so a lot of that, so we're, we're less concerned about it being positioned for, you know, global competitiveness and needing to make that case. We think it does that too, right? And I think for those organizations and corporations that, you know, see value in that, great. But for us, we want this to uh, not only empower our community, but to put something, put data in the hands of our, our businesses, our entrepreneurs, you know, our creators, our innovators, those who are supporting them to be able to have this applied economic approach um, from a source of truth. And we'll still use other pieces of data, but now we have something to level set it against, right? For instance, during the pandemic, you had tons of corporations giving money to black businesses. And for me, um, it was a little frustrating to see that, right? Because I thought, well, what a privileged response, right? One day you don't have funding, the next day you do. But what was even more alarming was that that wasn't sustainable, but, but also black business is not new. Right. We're not new to this. And so that's what made us start thinking about what is a more sustainable solution or strategy for this. Um, you have to quantify because right now, you know, if somebody gave one hundred million dollars, you know, to a certain region um, or group of entrepreneurs. We don't know how that moves the needle for us. We don't have anything to set it against. So there's a lot of work that we have to do. Um, we can't do it alone, which is why, you know, we're partnering with um, partners like you guys, but um, there's a lot of that work to be done. So I'll just say, you know, we're questioning everything, <laughs> you know, from a data perspective and um, and, um, and and so we'll use some traditional and some non-traditional methods, but um, we're, not, we're not making any assumptions. Um, we're not taking a quick way around. Uh, we're gonna, you know, start the work from the ground up. Excellent. All right. Our next question from Waitess Phelps says, uh, what, responsibility, what is the responsibility of public education in the education of youth and entrepreneurship? Yes, yes. So uh, fun fact, uh, my very first um, entre social entrepreneurial endeavor uh, was a youth entrepreneurship and innovation program uh, called CEO of My Life. And it still operates to this day. Um, we are partnered with Georgia Tech and the Enterprise Innovation Institute and our programs are held in tech incubators around the world um, for training young entrepreneurs. Uh, this was just a, a personal belief of mine is that you stop the bleeding where it starts. Um, I started out my career in education. And so uh, we, I knew how important it was. So when we launched the Future and Color Institute, um, it was important to embed this work and to protect this work within the uh, education system um, or within our educators, I'll say that, within our educators, um, which is why we're partnering with HBCUs and, and the Data Science Center and others. So um, for us, we want to indoctrinate our students from K through 12 all the way you know, to the PhD level um, and have them be the very people who are not only building this data, you know, but also utilizing it. Uh, so uh, when we think about 2053, that's not us, right? That is not our future, <laughs> it's their future. And so what's more important than us setting them up for success, giving them a strategic roadmap and data to help guide them um, is to uh, educate them and allow them the opportunity to build this with us. And so we're really excited about the educational model um, that really is the centerpiece of the Institute. Um, and so having uh, university students at HBCUs and community and black students at community colleges um, to be able to engage in this work, regardless of your major. I, we think what's interesting is that our data is focused on sectors and industries and regions. And so you have students that are from all over the world and the country, as well as um, that are majoring in different industries. And so we don't want them to think about their major or the work uh, or the career and workforce they're going into um, themselves as just you know workers, right? Or just business owners. We want them to understand the data of that. And, and I'll say this, 
we don't plan to lift that piece of it <laughs> completely. Um, and so uh, this is what the AUC Data Science Center um, is here for. And so uh, this is where strategic partnership comes in. So um, it has always been our intent to house this um, this this work um, with within students and within our educators. Um, and, and not the educational system, but our educators. And so uh, our fellowships through the Institute, um, those that'll be working on this work um, are black researchers, are black data scientists, and they are helming from all over the country, um, from black institutions and also community colleges within black neighborhoods. Amazing. Um, we have another question from Ursula Leverett. Thank you for leading with acknowledging the elephant in the room. Trust and historical implications seems to be a significant confounding factor that may have impacted our collective progress. What sectors and or micro alliances do you envision must be adopted to collect data that will support the inverse of zero negative strategy? Yes, thank you, Ursula. Um, we, we, we have to start with trust, right? Um, and so um, it, it is always the elephant in the room. Uh, some of so let me back up. Um, we realized that to get the community, to get businesses, entrepreneurs to adopt this data, to, to utilize it, um, we're not gonna be able to hand them a 300 page <laughs> black GDP report, right? So we have a, you know, a, a, a strategy and roadmap to be able to make this digestible. Um, and so some of the things that we're doing is looking at some of the industries and sectors like aerospace, like music, uh, uh, sports, entertainment, and others where um, there's been more of a um, more visible, um, you know, sort of economic contribution, right, to begin to build that new narrative and to insert that data into that and how that changes things. So um, we'll be, you know, work focusing on industries uh, that that are poised to do that. The healthcare industry is one, right? I mean, you know, equity and health uh, is life or death, right? And so um, being able to bring light to some of the um, issues and challenges within those sectors and industries, we don't want to skip over equity. And we're not saying that we're not going to focus on the disparities that are happening within these sectors and how they impact both our, our health, our social lives, and our economic lives. But um, we need to be able to get this data adopted. So for us, um, where, you know, I mentioned financial institutions, um, the, the energy sector, you know, uh, climate change is so interesting to me that uh, there's a lot of support and rallying around climate change and um, uh, zero carbon emissions. And we feel like, you know, the same way folks are looking at 2050 and, and zero uh, carbon emissions, and the UN is talking about this on a global level, this also, should be talked about. And this is also why we'll be, you know, in New York during the UN General Assembly um, as well. Uh, when you look at the demographic shifts around the world, I heard Melinda Gates on stage at CGI two years ago, and she was giving a story about um, the healthcare industry and how uh, she was looking at, you know, the year 2050. And this is where I got first heard that data point about the largest concentration of young people being on the continent of Africa. And so I was sitting there in the audience and everybody's like, yes, oh my gosh, you know, it's great that she said that. And, um, but what struck me was that she then gave like a, I think like a $50 million investment to this um, organization. Um, it was in South Africa and the founder was there and was thanking her. And when I was looking, I was just, I thought, hmm, it was great that she recognized that, right? Um, but if the future is Africa, if the largest concentration of young people in, in Africa. It struck me that Melinda Gates was the one that was determining what that future looked like from that investment, right, um, in the healthcare industry. So again, back to the four pillars, investments, ownership, advocacy, um, innovation. So, you know, we don't just want to talk about the, the numbers in those industries, but we, again, want to get folks more active in, in, in those, those spaces so that we can shape that future and have a hand in it. Um, we don't need to control all of it, but we should be centered in it. Um, and so anyway, that's that's my answer to like, you know, how we think about these industries and sectors, how that applies to the data, but also like, you know, our pillars and how we, why it's important to get people active um, because otherwise we end up just participating in a future that we didn't design. Ah, wow. 
Um, I think we should be able to uh, tackle uh, two more questions. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Ryan Clark who asks, this data is extremely valuable to large organizations who created and implement long-term strategies that extract economic resources from black communities in the US, African countries, and these communities from the diaspora. Have you encountered barriers in creating initiatives for the FIC and what is your approach to navigating around and or removing those barriers? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so yes, uh, as we think about the US and African countries, um, one of the things is that, you know, understanding like the landscape of what's happening now, there's a huge focus and a lot of initiatives focused on um, extracting resources from Africa, right? Um, there are a lot of other countries that have made it there that are doing the same thing. And so there's some efforts here, you know, in the US um, and in other countries to connect, you know, more African-American to African businesses. Um, and so there are a lot of companies that are, you know, focused on that. And why are they focused on it? Because you know, global competitiveness, right? They see that they see the demographic shift, the numbers shifting. These are their customers of the future, right? And so, um, but again, all of that is based off of spending power and all type, all things that are attractive to our communities. Uh, and so, one of the, you know, if you're asking about the challenges that we've had, I, I would say there's just something about being in the right moment in time. And I think what's interesting is that with all the DEI, you know, um, backlash and and how folks are trying to, you know, um, as Nicole Hannah-Jones said, uh, she called the, the strategy uh, colorblindness, right? They're trying to fuse this strategy of colorblindness. It's interesting that we're saying the future is color, right? The important part is to, is to see color. Um, so, you know, th th there's a, there, the folks that are standing sort of um, firm and 10 toes down on DEI and committed to it, you, you, you'll see that they figured out through their business models that this is smart, right? This is just good business and it is, right? And so the beautiful part about the future and color in this work is that we're in a place in time where um, we can't spend time trying to convince those that are just, you know, people that are racist and that just, you know, have those, that's personal work they have to do and we can't change that. But those, and I say people because I don't think, when I think of companies, I think of the people leading the companies and making the decisions, right? Um, which is why that is not sustainable because people come and go. And so, you know, policy is important in this, but uh, right now, uh, there aren't many challenges because the partners that we're working with, um, and we're simply going to work with those who want to work with us, right? Who recognize, uh, sorry, the value, um, but they see it, right? They're talking about it in their business meetings. There's some global corporations who we've heard are talking about, well, what are we going to do? Because, you know, in 2050 or in 2045, um, the majority of our customers or our workforce are going to be people of color, right? And so um, what does that mean for us? And so they're just starting to have those conversations. So, um, our data, right, is attractive um, from that sense. But then, um, you know, for us, it's important as an institute to be able to make sure that um, the real utility of this data goes to our community, right? Um, and so uh, with the corporations, um, I, you know, just like with ESG, you know, you have those who are jumping on board and they're making their commitments and we want them to make those commitments. This is good business. We shouldn't have to talk about race, right? Um, a, a good Black business is not just a good black business, it's a good business, right? And we've always contributed. So we're not trying to do, use this report to say, we need people to understand that, you know, black people create value. We know that, right? We know since the beginning of time, we just have never quantified it. And that changes the conversation. And it also puts us in a position to be able to uh, have real strategies and tools and to be able to measure against them. So those are the conversations we're having with the corporations they have data that can support this, that you know can give us different insights. Um, if they're willing to share it, great. If not, we are going to collect it on our own, <laughs> on the hard way, uh, primarily. And listen, we have enough. I truly believe that in our community, we have enough practitioners, we have enough data scientists, we have enough entrepreneurs, we have enough academics, we have enough economists. We have enough, right? And so we just needed an institute that was dedicated to this, and and that's why we exist. Wow. Oh. Wow, amazing work and an amazing way to, to wrap up this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Lakeisha. This has been Thank truly you. insightful. Uh, again, I, I dropped the link for the futureincolor.org and to the chat if anyone wants to connect. Um, as Lakeisha mentioned, um, there is high interest among faculty all over the AUC um, with connecting with the work that they're doing as well as uh, work that they're doing nationally, internationally. 
Um, so we invite you um, to please connect and um, you know stay in touch. Um, I'll, I'll keep track of the questions that we were not able to get to uh, to see if we can um, follow up um, with, with those questions that we were not able to answer today. Uh, but again, we are truly grateful for your presence here, Lakeisha, and for the work that you are doing globally um, to quantify the Black GDP and much more importantly, uh, move the diaspora forward. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Washington to close us out and thank you all for joining us for uh, this insightful uh, seminar uh, for the Data Science Initiative. Thank you for having me. And I don't know if Dr. Washington is still with us. Well, I think uh, you know, Dr. Washington may have had to jump to another meeting. Um, so uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your time and this investment and please, please reach out to us and let us know um, how we can uh, you know, better support you in things that you're interested in seeing and as well as uh, reaching out to uh, Lakeisha French and the future in color. Uh, thank you all for joining us. All right. She's muted. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> Great you. conversation. Very informative. Really loved it. And um, so thank you, Ms. French, for sharing. And also thank you, Dr. Ballinger, for just a really delightful conversation. And by the way, the, the Mr. Wattes Phelps who's on there, he was my first partner with our pre-freshman experience program when we did it at Evansville, Indiana. Oh, wow. I just want to shout out to well, Professor so cool. Jeff Phelps, uh, who, who's uh, here with us today, and everybody else who asked amazing questions. So, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.